Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland. Today, I get the privilege to uh, interview Andy Andrews. Andy, how you doing today? Good, Brett. Good, man. Good. It's uh, just an honor to be here with you. Well, it's an honor to have you. What you don't know is I was uh, probably, it was about 2002, maybe. I was at a conference, me and my closest 10,000 friends, and uh, somewhere in that area, and, and, and you were speaking. I've been a fan of yours uh, since that day, the first day I got introduced to you and read your books and uh, wow. love your speeches, man. So, well, thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're doing a great now, job. See, I'm, and, envi I'm envious of you with four boys. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, we, we have two boys, and they're 17 and 20 now, and I, I heard the ages of your boys, and I'm I'm like, envious because you're yeah. just getting into the fun part we are well i'll let you i'll tell you what andy i'll make you a deal why don't you come over to my house during this quarantine and you homeschool four boys Whew. and then tell me how envious you are of me yeah i hear you <laughs> we you know we homeschooled austin for a little while but we we decided pretty quickly we weren't smart enough to homeschool and so we hired a teacher to homeschool him. <laughs> that's awesome yeah that's great yeah yeah, the uh, I am not made out to be a homeroom teacher. I am uh, I am not good. And, uh, you know, Google and Siri have become my new best friends of how do I figure out, you know, fourth grade math? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I know. That's that's the thing. That's the problem. You know, at, here I am, a dad, and once they got past fourth or fifth grade, I'm like, yeah. I swear we weren't doing that when I was in the fourth grade. Yeah. And and so, and of course, they're still asking the same questions we were. Well, where, where, where am I going to use this? Right, you know, exactly. Like, yeah, it's a valid <laughs> question. A conversation I don't with know. your kid yeah. 20 years from now. So, yeah. Well, you've got, uh, gosh, 20, what, 20 plus books, about three and a half million copies, probably in soaring through that already. Uh, last I saw, uh, sold around the world, 40 something languages, uh, speaker, yeah. I mean, podcast. I uh, just interviewed Terry Bradshaw right before you got on the show with me here. And that was one of my idols as a kid. So, you're, you're doing all sorts of great stuff. But, Maybe for those people that don't know who Andy Andrews is, can it give us a lay of the land and what made you the man you are today? Yeah, I, you know, I was just normal person and growing up and, and um, great dad, great mom, great sister. And, and my parents died when I was 19 yeah. and mom died of cancer. My dad was killed in a car accident and it ended up, you know, I, I've always been able to take a bad situation and make it worse. And <laughs> I did just sure. that, you know, yeah. I, uh, I, I ended up literally homeless before that was even a word, you know, nobody was talking about homeless people. <clears throat> so this is like, gosh, this is 41 years ago. And nobody was talking about homeless people right. then, but I was literally living uh, under a pier on the Gulf coast in and out of people's garage. Wow. And you know, it, so it's not smart, but probably not safe, but, it, but, yeah. I, but I did. And, and, uh, it was it was a crazy time. I met an old guy uh, late one night under my pier, scared me to death, and uh, we called him the noticer, but we only knew his name was Jones. We didn't call him Mr. Jones, we called him just Jones, and, yeah. and, um, and this was the guy who first kind of told me the truth about myself, and, and you know, was when I say that- Was he homeless as well, or is he a guy that just came in and to talk to you guys? No, this was a guy, we, you know, we had seen this guy come and go for years and we never knew where he stayed when he came into town, never knew where he went when he left. And I mean, it's, my family had spent time down here before. Yeah. And, you know, after I had been here, I met him when I'd been here two years after like living under the beer about two years. And, and, um, and so, you know, people, would see him. He always carried a suitcase. Knew we never knew what was in it. Never let anybody touch it. Never, you know. He had on a, a t-shirt, blue jeans, leather leather flip flops, and uh, kind of longish white hair. And so we called him Jones. And and he would kind of. He just had a knack of showing up when somebody was in trouble. And that certainly was the case with me. And so if you ever read the book. Um, Brett, if you ever read the book, The Noticer, the very first chapter of that book is absolutely true, just like I wrote it down. Hmm. And, and so he was, but he was the first guy, you know, he, he said a lot of things to me during my life that have guided me. One of the, one of the best that I think of every single day is you can't believe everything you think. Hmm. Why isn't that the Which, truth? You know, keeps you looking, keeps you searching deeper. I mean, you know, it was a Mark Twain that said that 
it's not the things that you don't know that get you in trouble. It's these things that you know for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You can't believe everything you think. And that is so true. So true. Well, and, and would you say like you, you had to grow up with some, I am assume, maybe, maybe not, I shouldn't assume that. Right. Um, but you know, positive uh, affirmations or, or, or uh, no. your, your values. No, I mean, because it's like, here you are, you went from this kid from what I've studied and researched about you is you, you grew up kind of in a normal life, right? Right. Middle-class yeah. America. I mean, I mean, my parents were, were, were great, but I, I never read any, you know, nobody ever said, Hey, you need to read these books. Nobody ever, yeah. nobody ever said that to me. And, yeah. and um, it was actually under the pier. The very first, probably the second time, second time that I met Jones is the very first time he mentioned it. But the second time he brought me three books from the library and now I hated biographies. I'll just tell you that. Yeah. I don't know why. I guess because they made us read them in school and I didn't see the point, but I just kind of hated them. And I had always been like a field and stream sports illustrated guy. I didn't yeah. read a whole bunch anyway. And, um, and so one night he says to me, he says, Hey, I got you these three books. And I look and I immediately know these are biographies because they have nothing but the name on the spine. Yeah. And it was uh, George Washington Carver, Winston Churchill, and um, Will, Will Rogers. And, and I, I said, biographies? And he said, no, 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 these are adventure stories. These are mysteries and thrillers. These are, these are romances, and they're all true. I was like, oh. And he said, yeah, I got them from the library. When you get through, take them back. And so I'm like, all right. And, and I started reading the Churchill one that night, Brad. I didn't, not really because I wanted to, but more because he was the only person in my life paying any attention to me. And I knew he was going to ask, hey, have you read the books? And I want to be able to say, I, I'm reading the Churchill one right now. But as I'm reading this, you know, like the very first chapter, Churchill meets this little girl called Clementine in kindergarten. And little did he know that one day she would grow up to be the prime minister's first lady. And, and so I, I just kind of laughingly to myself, I said, yeah, well, there's the romance, you know? <laughs> and, but every time I get to the end of the chapter, the end of the chapter was something like, and if he had only known what was on the other side of the door, Winston would have never gone into the room. And I go, oh, crap. Yeah, right. I got to keep reading. Yeah, keep reading. That's, uh, there's the mystery. And then yeah. World War II starts, and there's the, you know, there's the thriller and the spies yeah. and all. And so I really kind of got hooked into these. And, and I ended up reading over 200 biographies wow. of these people, these, uh, you know, very successful, great people. And yeah. I, I always think, you know, when I say these great people, I think, do they do biographies of any other kind of people? You know, so it's like Good there's point. our loser section at Barnes & Noble. Yeah, exactly. But, but these people, I began to see, you know, that, you know, you read 200 biographies, things become a, a little clearer anyway. Yeah. But my question through this time was, man, all these people are, are there, is there, were they just born this way? Or is it something that you do? You know, because if they, if, if, if you're just born this way, then I'm out of luck. Yeah. You know, because I'd heard the, the thing, you know, the, I'd heard people say, well, God will put a man after his own heart where he wants him to be. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. You put me under a pier. Yeah, appreciate and, that. Yeah. And so I, you know, I really thought, man, if I, if I determined that life is just a lottery ticket, you know, I don't know that I want to stay. And so I, as I read these books, I began to compile some things that these people had or were and I didn't really know what to call them I called them things at first and then yeah. but I, they weren't these aren't and I and I eventually settled on seven of them and some sometimes people ask us why seven well because there were seven I mean if That's there had been eight or nine I could have done that but you know if there you know, there was but there was more than five there was less than nine and and I didn't know what to call them but I, they're not these weren't uh, seven habits these weren't seven theories they weren't seven ideas they weren't uh and they weren't mine i mean i didn't come up with them i just like identified them and they're nothing earth shattering you, you know on the face of it um but i did think as i as i read these books i did think i wonder i wonder you know it seemed like every one of these people they had two or three of these things that they knew they had it and they harnessed that that 
to use it. You know, these were right. principles is what they were. Yep. And because these principles, because they're principles, they work every time. And so they would harness these two or three. And I, I, you know, I got good at looking and finding the others in their lives, but I never found anybody that I thought they knew they had all seven. And so that made me think, well, what happens to somebody who knows all seven? What happens to a life, to that life? You know, what happens yeah. to a kid whose parents understand all seven of these decisions, these principles, and teaches to them to their kid? You know, a life lived based on principle is is a lot easier, a lot quicker to the to the facts. It, it's it's certainly a lot easier than a life where you got to Google the answer every time a question right. comes up, because if you if you live your life according to principle, so many of the decisions that we struggle with can already be made. We we have already have those made. Yeah. So let's talk about those. That's actually was the first thing in my notes right here. You talk about the seven things people have, and I know we could do a whole episode just on this. So walk us through, walk our listeners through what are those seven things and what's the difference between, like you said, the, the man or woman that may be really good at two of those, but what happens when you harness and, and, and take over all seven right. of them? You know, so much is, uh, is really predated on just knowing them and just understanding a little about them because it, when I tell you these, and I appreciate so much, Brett, the time to tell you. I used to hate when when I wrote The Traveler's Gift, and The Traveler's Gift is the book that came out of these seven things, right? It's the story of a man, uh, his life is ruined and family ruined, and so he gets to travel through time, meeting with seven historical figures who are also going through the toughest time in their life. And each of these seven people give him a decision that they've written for him that if he puts it in his life, things will change. So that's how I finally presented these. But when I, when I would go on talk shows to talk about the book, I'd hate it when, you know, you have three minutes and they go, right. well, tell us about the seven decisions. Cause if you just list them, they seem like, Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I've yeah. heard that. Cause the first one's responsibility. I mean, who hadn't heard that? Right. Yeah. And, but I can give you just a little bit on each of them that will let you know, there's a lot more to it. If you harness you know, the wisdom of that principle, there's a lot you can do with it. And so it's like responsibility. It's a big fight. It's something everybody thinks they know about. You don't read a newspaper or watch a sports program without hearing the word. Right. And, and there seems to be two different sides to the issue. One side says, until these people learn responsibility, they're never going to be able to. And then you got the other side going, but it's not their fault. Don't you understand yeah. what their parents were like? And, and, yeah. and, and yet that these two sides, both of them are tragically far away from the truth about responsibility because responsibility is not about making people feel bad about where they're from or, uh, you know, making people uh, feel guilty or, you know, responsibility is about hope and control. And who among us doesn't want to have hope for a greater future we can control? Yep. But you know, if, if you're blaming your mother, if you're blaming the president, if you're blaming the weather, if you know, there's not a lot of control there. And so Sorry, there's I'm not a lot of control. smiling here, Andy. I, 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 this little guy just showed up. He walked in the room. Hey! Can you say hi on the hi. microphone? Hi. How are you doing? Man, where'd you get that pretty hair? Say so your mom. My mommy. My mom. How old are you, buddy? What's that? How old? How old are you? About to be six. What? About to Five be and a half. Got awesome. a birthday Dude. next week. You tell Mr. Yeah. Andy goodbye. Bye. Bye bye. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's the joy oh, of working good. at home. And I love seeing that red hair, man. I just I turned it. It's blonde. Into... It was all it's all blonde. It looks red here in the picture, maybe in the camera. Oh, really? It's all blonde. Okay. Yeah, man. It looks red as it can be to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's but, all right. So number one yeah. was responsibility and I interrupted yeah. you. There, and so, so, so responsibility is about hope and control. But if you blame your mother, you blame the president, there's not a lot of hope there because there's no control. That's right. right? I mean, it, it, you know, if, if where we have ended up in our lives personally really is the fault of the president of the United States, then I, I might as well jump off a cliff today. I mean, what am I going to do about the president? Whoever yeah. the president happens to be, what yeah. am I going to do? Uh, you, know, you know, if it really is my wife's fault, well, what are we going to do about my wife? I can't control my wife. I don't know if you can right. control you. No, but, no. And so, so, but if we could look in a mirror and say, you know, I've had some crazy things happen and I've had some tragedies happen and I couldn't control any of them, yeah. but I have made responses 
to those crazy things that have led my life down a path to a place I don't like. If we can understand that we can make choices that'll leave us, lead us to a place we don't like, that's great news. Because if you can understand and believe you can make choices that'll lead you to a place you don't like, doesn't it just make logical sense you could make choices that lead you to a place you do like? So the game becomes make better choices. And that's what the other six principles are about. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's, I call it the bounce back theory. And, and so anytime you get bad news, the most successful people, they bounce back usually quicker than most people. Right. It's very curious, even in this time uh, with the virus, it's very curious to see how people are reacting. You know, there's a, uh, I, I'm sure you've heard of the, the Stockdale paradox when Admiral Stockdale was in the Vietnamese prison in, in the war. And he was in the worst prison of them all. He was in the Hanoi Hilton, they called it, in five and a half years, tortured over 20 times. And, and when he finally got out, they asked him, they said, what was your mindset during that time? And he said, I decided early on that this was going to be the pivotal point in my life, a time that I would look back on and never want to change. Hmm. And I, you know, I hear that and I think, okay, well, I lived under a pier and I can, I, now I kind of say I would never have chosen that, but it shaped who I've become. But what he was saying is he decided that when he was in it, right? He decided what the outcome was going to be when he was in it. And they, and this is curious. They ask him, well, who, you know, who had a harder time? Who didn't make it out? And he said, it was the optimist that didn't make it out. Hmm. And I said, oh, wait, that sounded like what you said sounded pretty optimistic. He said, no, I was not optimistic. He said, I was realistic in the face of adversity. He said, there were people who said, okay, we're going to be out by Christmas time. And then they weren't. Okay, but we'll be out by Easter. And then they weren't. But we'll be home by summer. And then it didn't happen. And he said, these people died of broken hearts. He said, I didn't put a date on it. I just knew I was getting out. Wow. And, and it's a, I think it's a lesson for us with this coronavirus right now. I think we need to be very careful, you know, I mean, because we, we hear um, leaders say things that they think people want to hear. And, you know, we need leaders to lead, not leaders to just work on getting reelected. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that you're absolutely right on all that stuff about the, uh, the responsibility. I love that. So tell us number two, what, what's that one? Number two is, uh, is, is have it really having a, a servant's heart and being, being the kind of person who is willing to serve. You know, this is King Solomon in the book and it's, it's a, it's an unusual place. You know, David Ponder goes into where King Solomon is saying, bring me the sword and I'll tell you whose baby this is. And he gets to see all this happen. Then goes back and talks with Solomon. And, and so this, this whole, this whole time with, with Solomon is, is gearing up about serving and seeking wisdom and becoming the person that can understand how to make those good choices. You know, because the, that search for wisdom is not a search for knowledge. You got to have knowledge to have wisdom, but you can have knowledge and not have wisdom. Mm. You know, uh, people with 20 college degrees, you can't get a job and can't get out right. of the rain. I mean, that's, that's just almost a cliche now. Yeah. And, and so it is wisdom we want to seek. It, this is uh, wisdom that has proven itself through the ages and has great reference and great power today. And so that's what that, that one is about, is about continuing to seek wisdom, which is why, you know, why you read a book again, uh, right? I, I've had, I've had I, I remember asking a guy one time, he told me he had read uh, one of my books like five times. And I was like, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, I was a different person every time I read it it meant something different to me every time I read it. I, I learned something that I didn't get before every time I read it. But I, he said, I read it like three or four years apart and I was a different person. And that made sense to me. So it I started sense. Yeah. reading other books like that. But it's a, that search for wisdom that we want. And so that was the second one. Okay, number three? Number three is being a person of action. You know, you can, you can know it. And if you don't do it, 
nothing happens. God feeds the birds, but he doesn't throw the worms in their nest. <laughs> you know, you really have to really have to do something. I mean, it seems to be the most, the most easily understood, most often ignored principle that there is yeah. because you find so many times when people don't know what to do, they do nothing. I mean, I see that all the time, and and I, I I see that tendency in myself. You know that okay, let me just hang on a little bit because I'm not really sure what to do. Right. And so, I I know that there has to be some uh, dramatic edge to push myself to get myself going when I don't know what to do. And and I've always felt that the quality of your answers can only be determined by the quality of your questions. So even, especially with yourself, you, you ask good questions, you'll get good answers. But you ask bad ones, you know, you're yep. still, your subconscious goes to work answering those things, you get bad answers. But a good question to ask when you don't know what to do, at least for me, this is kind of silly, but it works. And I, as I say, okay, Andy, I know you don't know what to do, but if you did know what to do, hmm. what would you do right now? Right. Yeah. I know you don't know who to call, but if you did know who to call, who would you call right now? Well, that's what I do with my boys. I, they will say, you know, I don't know. They'll say the answer. But if you did know, what would it be? You did you know. know. I can't put yeah. my seatbelt on. You know, well, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. But to your point with action, be a person of action. You know, there's four circuits to the circuit of success, right? Hence the name of the show. And the third one is action. So it's right. attitude, right? You get to choose that. It's your belief system, what belief you believe system. to your core, right? And then number four is, or number, sorry, number three no. for me is action. Is you can know everything there is to know about whatever it is in your industry. But I always say, if you can't, you may have the best slap shot in the world, but if you can't ice skate, you're not gonna be a very good hockey player. Right. So you got to go out and take action. And so yeah. uh, anyway, so I agree wholeheartedly with that. So number four. Excellent. Number four is having a decided heart, which fits in with, with, with your, your circle of belief. Um, I think more people fail at what they do because of an undecided heart than for any other reason. Yeah. Uh, and, and we see this, you know, you know what I'm talking about. People have, they have a decision to make and they think about it and they talk about it and they think about it more. And then they make the decision. And then they talk to the friends about whether they should have made it or whether they should have made it that way or waited. And then they take the decision back. And then they talk to the friends about whether they should have taken it back. And life becomes this ongoing state of analysis. But you know, the purpose of analysis is to come to a conclusion. That's the purpose of it. Yep. And so uh, this, this idea of a decided heart, this is basically the leadership principle because people want to follow people who know where they're going. Nobody wants to follow somebody. You, you watch this guy, you know, I don't know who this guy is, but this guy in Georgia, he's going to be a yep. one term governor. Yep. I, I mean, you know, it, it, three weeks after Florida and Alabama are closing their beaches, he just says he's got some new news and they're going to close up because the new news is that you can catch this virus without showing any symptoms. They're like, new news? Where have you been? Right. You know? And then yeah. two weeks later, he says, okay, we're going to open again. Well, people sense an undecided heart. You know, kids want parents who have decided hearts. Hmm. Employees want employees with decided hearts. We want to live around people with decided hearts. Nobody, nobody feels good about being around somebody who doesn't know where they're going. Amen to that. What does it say in the Bible? Without vision, people perish. Yeah. Right. Number five. Number five today, I will choose to be happy. And, you know, I'm not sure. I wrote the book a while back. I'm not sure happy is the greatest word there. But it says what we think of. I think, but I'm not sure that you can, like, just choose I, you know because because i'm not talking about somebody who's going well five minutes ago i chose to be happy and now i am i mean that seems kind of stupid you know but i think we can choose to be grateful and then when we choose to be grateful that feeling we have is kind of what we call happiness but you can really sit down and write down things you have to be grateful for and when you get that perspective going in your life it's a different life you live well, I think too, if you look at it just through what we're going through right now is self quarantine, right? And there's a lot of people that are in a very, very tough situation, right? I, and it, it is, but there are still millions or billions of people that would trade places with us, right? And I think uh, yeah. when you wake up every morning, 
for me, it's, it's waking up and saying, I, I get to stay at home. Right. And yeah. I, I get to stay safe here because it, it's, it's so true. I mean, we could be out having me on the front line of this thing and yeah. I'm very blessed those, to be at home. Yeah. And for those of us with a roof over our head with enough food to eat, we got to remember there's 3 billion people that'll go to bed tonight without either. That's right. That's exactly right. So yeah, I think it's good. Do you have a, do you have a process for that? Do you, do you get up every morning and have like a journal you write in about gratitude you know, or anything? It's, you know, I, I go through periods of time with this that, that a lot of times I will play a game with myself. I have a pad of paper beside the bed and my, you know, I, I will frame these rules around my life, you know, that I, I, they're enforceable only by me, yep. but I, I'll put this pad by my bed and my rule is I don't get out. I don't put my feet on the floor until I write something on a pad that I'm grateful for. And then my rule is I don't get a shower before I write something on the pad. And my rule is I don't brush my teeth until I, and my rule is that I don't go to the kitchen. Until, and, you know, by the time I get to the office, I've got 10 or 12 things down there. And after a few days, I start to realize, you know, they're the same 10 or 12 things generally. Right. But, but I also realize how much I have to be grateful for. It. And so, but there have been times that I, that I have needed, you know, that you need to go and be alone and you need to write down 50 things you had to be grateful for. And, and man, if you don't think you can find them, you can find them very fast. Yeah. Living like we all live, you know, you know, Brett, you know, you can find these things fast. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just, we were talking, you know, our, both of us, good friend, John O'Leary. I mean, you look at the stuff he deals with versus what we have to deal with. I mean, if you, right. I think if you ask John or you ask a guy that I had on the other day with, you know, we don't think about just, I'm thankful for my right leg. Yeah. I'm, I'm thankful for my left hand that works really well. I mean, and it's yeah. so simple, but those are the things you, you, like you said, if you're going to write down 50, you're going to start getting into that type of thing. Right. Yeah. That's just so, true. Uh, so today I will choose to be happy or today I'll choose to be grateful. Number six. Number six is a forgiving spirit. You know, to greet each day with a forgiving spirit. And for so long, I thought forgiveness was something that somebody had to earn or that somebody had to ask for. But I understand now that in, in all the books that I've read, all the people I've talked to, nobody has ever credibly shown me any evidence that for one person to forgive another person, that this person has to ask for it or deserve it, or even know that it's happening. And I'm not talking mm. about the spiritual touchstone many of us believe it, it, as forgiveness. I'm talking about what do what do you have within your power? You know, when you were laying awake at night and thinking about that guy and what he said and yeah. what you should have said and you know, all been out of shape. This guy's across town sleeping peacefully, unaware that yeah. you're you know that you're even upset. And 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 so the idea is whose life is it ruining? It's ruining ours. Right now he is. He don't care. He may not even know he did anything. But what do you say to that guy that's listening right now or that, that uh, lady listening right now and says, yeah, Andy, but you don't understand this, this man and woman, they really did piss me off. Right. And I don't yeah. want to forgive them right now. Or my ego is too big to forgive them right now. How do you help them with that? Well, I understand not wanting to forgive them, but here, here's the thing. If you look at, uh, that, that grudge you're holding, you know, statistics tell us, it's your life that's going to be shortened. You know, it's, it's your life. It's that, that hypertension is attacking, that, that, that attitude, that, that feeling. You know, it's, it's your life that is going to be shortened. And again, you know, this person over here may not even be aware they've done anything or may not care. Right. And, and so to be able to live the rest of your life, you can put that aside. You can start over. And sometimes I talk about this, Brett, and people say, well, you know what? So they're just going to get away with it? And I'm like, no, no, we're not talking about getting away with anything. You know, this is uh, don't misunderstand forgiveness and trust. See, forgiveness is about you. Trust is about them. Forgiveness is about our past, putting away our past, not letting it, not letting our past paint our future. Okay. Forgiveness is about our past. Trust is about the future. So do you forgive somebody who steals from you? Sure. Do you continue to do business with them? Probably not. Do you forgive somebody who lies to you? 
Sure. Do you continue to believe everything they say? No. Yeah, that's a great perspective right there. I like that. Forgiving spirit. And you're right. It is the, it is harder on us, right? The, the person that is holding on to that grudge. That is, that's not, it's not a good feeling at all. Right. Right. And I mean, we've all been there, you know, you, you, you don't want to go into that mall because you might run into that guy. You know, yeah. you, you don't want to even, you don't even go in that restaurant because you know, he goes in that restaurant. I mean, I mean to live yeah. your life hiding from somebody who's not even thinking about you. Yeah. I, yeah. I heard one time somebody said, you'd be greatly disappointed if you actually knew how much other people thought of you. <laughs> you know, right. And right. So, uh, uh, number seven, last, but certainly not least. Is persisting without exception. It's, it's something people think they've heard, but they haven't heard the without exception part because the persisting without exception allows you to find a way where there is no way. Um, you know, why in our world today, persisting is not enough because in our world today, you get people, there's no, uh, there's no consequences for quitting. You can quit anything you want nope. in our world today if you've tried. You know, if you just persist in people, because this is what people say, they, they'll say, oh, you tried, man, you tried. I mean, if anybody can do that, you should. Yeah. yeah, so you try. And and so, but persisting without exception is when you run up against that wall and you can't find a way, okay, well, if you're going to persist without, a way, without exception and you can't find a way, then now you just have to find a way where there is no way. Well, what does that look like? Well, I, first of all, I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. There are three defaults everybody has when they hit that wall. They say, well, I'm out of time. You know, look at the calendar. If we had time left, maybe we could, or I'm out of money. I mean, if we had the money, maybe we could have, but we don't, you know. And the other is, it's, a, it's leadership. It's not our fault anyway, if we had the right leadership in this place. And so, right. in truth, none of those are the issue. They're just kind of symptomatic. And, and you're not lacking time, money, or leadership. You're only lacking one thing, and that's an idea. Hmm. One idea. We've seen one idea make billions of dollars. We've seen one idea save millions of lives. And one idea will get you from where you are to where you want to be. You know, it, there is a difference in a thought process that allows an idea where one person will think this is the worst time in our lives. One person will figure out how to turn it into the best time in their life. Yeah. With the very same situation. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And that's what I was mentioning earlier, right? You see people out and about. How are you doing? Oh man, you know, it's just, just another day, I'm tired of this. Yeah. I'm ready for the world to open. You know, it's like they have this pity party and it's like, okay, great. But have your pity party. Now let's move on. Right. What are you doing to be right. different? What are you doing? Not to be different, but to, to think differently and, and, and react differently and think differently. So it's just, I don't know. It's uh, my wife and I've talked a lot about that. We're noticing that about different people and, uh, and how people are handling it. So, right. Um, right. What are you doing differently though? So if you can, let's talk about that for a second. Do you have any idea where you'd be today? If, if, if the world was just the same as it was, you know, six weeks, eight, eight weeks ago, where, where would Andy Andrews be today? Do you know? Uh, I don't know that answer, but. Might be in Dallas. You know, Dallas. I mean, I'd, pro I'd probably be speaking somewhere. Um, yeah. I mean, it's April. I'd probably be speaking yeah. somewhere. Speaking and, somewhere, uh, so maybe in Dallas. But so you've had to adapt, right? You've had to change. And I know today yeah. you were on numerous live calls and doing things. So what are you doing and what advice can you give people? Here's the, the main thing. If you want to find a way to really capitalize on some kind of time that you're in or some kind of situation like we're all in right now, the, the one question you should ask yourself is what value can I bring to people? What value can I bring? What value can I provide? And I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about it's just what value can I provide? You know, everybody is looking for somebody to give something to them. Okay, so what if you're the only person that's looking to do something for somebody else? I'll tell you this. You know, I, I talk about uh, being homeless and people get some kind of view in their mind of that. Uh, because of the way things are now. Uh, but it wasn't even a word then. And I didn't even use the word about myself until like 10 years after it happened because I was telling a friend about living under the pier and, you know, eating fish like 15 meals a week and, and uh, selling bait and washing boats. And he said, well, dude, you were like homeless. And I was like, 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he said he, he slept in the sand. Yeah. So you were homeless. Did you get like have like food stamps and stuff? And I was like, I could have, I guess. I, but no, I didn't, it didn't cross my mind. And and honestly, it was a thought process then, and it's a thought process now. Uh, it always the 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 juxtaposition between people holding signs and saying you know, anything will help. And the sign saying help wanted, it's just, it blows my mind. And, and I got to say, you know, people would probably not like me to say this, but I'm always thinking in terms of how can I show value? And I teach young people, you show your value show value, bring value to the table. You do whatever you want to do. I mean, you want to create your own business. Well, how can you be valuable to somebody? You can create your business out of your passions that way very easily. But, but to see people, and I see this a lot, to see people on the side of the road holding a sign and sitting there while there's just trash around them. I, I mean, I, I'm like, pick up the trash, pull some weeds. Right. That's a good point. Do something. I mean, you, you, you know, would you hire somebody who's sitting there on a bucket with trash around them with weeds everywhere? I mean, no, but is there a chance that the, the store owner up, up there would, would give somebody $10 if they saw them pulling weeds and stuff? Yeah, probably. And might find something else for them to do, you know? Yeah. And, and so we have to be people who get ahead of the game and provide value, not just sit around and promise value if you give me so-and-so. Right. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I think the guy has a nice shiny corner and, you know, looks good. That's probably a better chance I'm going to buy him something. I had a guy the other day, I was going to get him some food, and he started yelling and cussing at me for no reason. I'm like, like, that's probably not a way to get your needs met, right? (laughs) He's he's like, I need six sugars and two creams, and he's giving barking all these orders at me and cussing, and I'm like, what is going on right now? Like we started this off a little differently than, than we're, we're getting ready to end this. Right. Yeah. So don't be too picky, I guess would be the word. So <laughs> if, uh, if Andy Andrews, unfortunately would be sitting on his deathbed, what's that one message you hope somebody understands from you? You hope those, those cool boys back there with the cheese heads on, they're both running their own businesses right now. What do you hope they hear? I want these guys to understand that they can act like they want to act despite feeling another way Mm. that even though you're not so happy in the morning that you act happy and you can act happy and you can smile while you talk, you know, because all of these things lead others into, uh, into our sphere of influence. And, and so, this, this is one way that we can affect and help people in their lives. And so you can, you can act a certain way, even though you feel a different way. It's, it's one of the biggest things I want people to know. It's, it's one of the biggest things I want my boys to know yeah. is that, you know, your feelings, you, you, you never got anything because of your feelings. You get things because of what you do. Life changes because of what you do or don't do, but not because of how you feel. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And so would you say when I hear you talk a lot is I hear the word choice in there, right? There, there, yeah. It, There's, you choice. know, the, the, and, and the choice, it, curiously, the choice is not the bottom of the pool on the thing. The choice is what we kind of continue to say. We, we say, well, the, you know, your choices uh, ultimately become your destiny, but really there's a foundation below the choice and that is your thinking. It's your thinking that controls your choices. However you think, what you think, how long you think about it, what you don't want to think about, what you decide you're not going to think about while you think about this so that you can choose. I mean, it's your thinking that determines your choices. But the curious thing about that is it's a wonderful paradox because even though your thinking determines your choices, you can choose how you think. You can choose because you get to choose what you watch. You choose who you're around. You choose what you will read and what you're going to listen to. And maybe more importantly to choosing your thinking, you get to choose what you will not watch and who you will not be around and what you will not listen to and what you will not read. You choose Amen your to thinking. that, Andy. 
I like it. So our listeners right now, if they want to find more of Andy Anders, I know you got andyanders.com. They're shipping yeah, books I'll, still. Yeah, yeah, we're shipping books. Amazon's not, but you can just go to andyanders.com, get them less expensive anyway. <laughs> and uh, we uh, we have a, a 12.30, or no, 12.15, excuse me, what am I saying? 12.15 p.m. Central Time live show, a couple of three times a week, and we do it on social media platforms, on Facebook, on YouTube and it's live 12 15 central time. And it's called the Andy Andrews blue plate special. And we do it. We go live for 30 or 40 minutes and we talk to people sometimes. Sometimes we talk to each other and, and we have a great time. It's just lunchtime learning and laughter kind of emphasis on the laughter. And, um, but that's happening and you can, you know, just go on my Facebook page or YouTube page and put a notification thing. So they'll notify you when we're live. I love it. And, um, and then, you know, I, I have a podcast too. It's not as big and brilliant, and beautiful as yours. Uh, but it, I don't know about that. It, the, the professional noticer once a week is my podcast. I like it. I listened to that today, actually. I was awesome. driving and listening to it. It's good stuff. So Thank um, you, buddy. last question for you. What, but if you could go back and give yourself some feedback, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, what, what feedback would you give that guy? You know, I would, I would probably say, give yourself a break. Don't be so, don't feel mm. like you're behind. You know, I, I, I think that 10 or 15 years ago, I looked at my life and I, I just felt like I, you know, I would see other people pulling ahead and, you know, they're running their race and I'm running my race. And, and I, and I quickly learned that we can run together and we can help each other I, you know, that you don't have to compete with everybody out there who seems to be doing what you're doing right. they, because they're not doing what you're doing. And, and so, you know, I, I learned well to give myself a break in some situations that I was kind of hard on myself with. Yeah. I think that's hard because we're all so driven, right? Driven to help people and driven to build your business or whatever it may be. And I think it's, I don't know about you, but sometimes we get hard. And I talked to a lot of successful people about this is we're so dang hard on ourselves, or it's never good enough. Right. right. It's just, it, but then when you look back and you know, I've been in the professional world now for 20 years and it's like, I, I agree with what you just said. Like, I wish I'd give myself a darn break where it, it's not, it, it's going to be okay. Right. You're going right. to, you're going to be just fine, but yeah, it's man. hard in the I mean, moment to do that. Yeah. And with your boys, the age they are now, Brett, don't, you know, don't, don't look back five years from now and go where, I mean, you will do that anyway. Yeah. Okay. But just don't do it in regret because it's going to go by fast, man. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm an old dad. I mean, we didn't have our first boy till I was 40 and then our next one at 43. And, you know, so when people told me, they said, Hey, it's going to go by fast. It's going to go by so fast. I listened and I really have paid attention and it still has gone by fast. Yeah. Did you do anything that you look back as a dad? I lied. I said that was my last question a while ago. We're still talking. But uh, did you, would you give any recommendation to us parents that are in that moment? Because when you're in the moment, sometimes it's crazy, right? And, and the best thing yeah. for me about this quarantine deal is everything has been eliminated, right? The, the sports are right. going crazy. I mean, we're having dinners together. We're having lunch together every day. It's phenomenal. So I'm loving this season of life. Uh, as bad, I, Obviously, disclaimer, I want everything to go away. I want people to stay safe. But when I remove all that and I look at it from a family standpoint, this has been phenomenal, right? For my wife right. and I's relationship with my kids. But what advice when the world goes back to crazy, which it will, uh, do you have to be in the moment with your kids? You know, there, there is such a need for parents to, to explain, to explain. Hmm. You know, we, because that is how you will shift your child's thinking and and there are some things that we need to shift our thinking on you know i hear people all the time talking about we're just trying to raise great kids you know our kids are a priority we want to raise yeah. great kids and and that that is a thought process that is just rife with possibilities to screw you up because in actuality you you're not trying to raise great kids you want to raise kids who become great adults that's two different things right and two different pathways you know, lead to each of those things. And so to, to raise a child who is going to be a great adult, they have to understand 
and they can't start when they get to be 19. Okay. You know, the answers can't be because I say so. The answers can't be as long as you live in my house because I'm your father. These can't be the answers because those answers explain nothing. And we can make them do what we want them to do because we're bigger than they are. And we have all the money. Right. Okay. But there comes a time that when they get away from us, if we haven't explained along the way, then they're going to test the limits of everything they have been told to believe. And they're going to test them without you around. Yeah. And, and so if, but if we're allowed to, if, we're, if we allow them to think through it and we think through things with them and talk through things with them. And then when they become adults, they've already made a lot of the decisions that are knocking the legs out from under a generation now. Yeah, that's good. That's great feedback. And I think you might have been in my house, though, because I, I might have used those a couple of times in the last. I know season. I have to. Because have the to. PlayStation. Why? Because I said so. Because you because live in my I house said. and I'm tired of watching you play the dang PlayStation. That's why. Yeah. Get yeah. off of it. So. Hey, there's a time and place for that. There's that's a right. time and place for that. That's right. But, but I, I think the time and place is long gone when, when they're teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's funny. Uh, all right. So andyandrews.com, check it out there. We'll do your blue, uh, blue space, blue plate special. That's hard <laughs> to say. Uh, 1215 central time on any of the social media platforms. And Andy, it's been a pleasure, man. It's been awesome having you. It's, it's kind of surreal for me to know. I watched you with again, 10,000 of my closest friends. And, uh, now here you are, you and I, mano y mano. Oh, buddy, I'm, I am proud of you. I'm proud for you. So thank you for having me on. Thanks for being here.